The Principle of Hope by Ernst Bloch, Volume 1, Chapter 12. Various Interpretations of the Basic Human Drive. The Sexual Drive. But the body must first and foremost strive towards something. After all, what is the principal motivating force of our mind and energies as they stand in the present? As we know, Freud posits the sexual drive as the first and most powerful. Accordingly, libido governs life. It is fundamental both in terms of time and content. Already the sucking of the uh, suckling is supposedly connected with sexual pleasure and takes place largely for the sake of this pleasure. Even hunger is supposedly subject to the sex drive. Its satisfaction becomes sexual relaxation. The relationship to our own body and thereafter to external objects, and all the more so to people around us, thus appears to be always primarily sexual. But libido did not remain the sole impulse in Freud, at least not libido in the sense of positive pleasure. The later Freud stressed alongside it a tendency towards negative pleasure, namely the death drive. The animal will is then also assigned to the death in store for it, not only to mating. Just as multicellular creatures drive towards death from the outset, and mortal decomposition already sets in in youth, in vascular contraction, for example, there is also a separate drive towards the process of dying, of growing cold. It is the destructive and aggressive drive. Freud sought to identify it as a separate, though always libidinally colored drive in sadistic desires. The din of life which emanates from love is supposed to be silenced or destroyed by this same libido. The wish for destruction expresses itself with respect to our own body in the pleasure taken in bare discipline in the various ascetic tendencies. With respect to other bodies and objects, the death drive expresses itself as cruelty, as the undeniable frenzy of destruction now raining down on others. That the death drive is also libidinal, however, is supposedly indicated by the universal connection between cruelty and sexual pleasure, above all also by the emotion of libestad, in any case, the core is and remains sexual here. This is what motivates Freud's man. Ego drive and repression. Only later is this joined by another narrower power. Of course, this narrowness, even sharpness in man is important, since it is his ego. Freud indicates time and again, not without retreating occasionally, that apart from the sex drive and the death drive related to it, he has distinguished a purely human drive. For if there were only libido and nothing else, then neither conflicts nor neuroses could arise in us. Next to the dark id of the body and its drives, however, stands the ego, according to Freud. The ego drives stand opposite the sexual powers. Indeed, the whole of psychoanalysis, says Freud, has been built up upon the sharp division of the sexual drives from the ego drives. The ego affirms, denies, and censors the drives. Consciousness depends on it. It is the power which makes our mental life coherent. It is the power which goes to sleep at night and then still operates dream censorship. The ego drive represses what does not fall into line with it in the sexual drives, in their contents um, of of which more later. Thus, our mental life is dualistic. In spite of the libido, which began everything here, it moves between the coherent ego and the repressed material that is split off from it. Precisely this tension leads, if it leads to contradiction, to pathogenic conflict, one between the ego drives and the sexual drives. From the ego emanate the repressions through which certain mental tendencies are excluded, not only from consciousness, but also from the other kinds of validity and application. This material removed by repression confronts the ego in analysis, and the analysis is given the task of eliminating the resistances to dealing with the repressed material expressed by the ego. The ego sees to the removal of unpleasant feelings through the fulfillment of drives, 
but it sees to this fulfillment in its own way, in a censoring, moralizing way, and above all, with respect to what can be achieved, to reality. This moralizing element, i.e. what is adapted to the practices of Freud's bourgeois environment, is, according to Freud, the acquired line of the ego drive. Thus, there even occurs a penetration of the libido, hence of the pleasure principle, which otherwise determines all drive processes. The adult, or better, the bourgeois individual seen by Freud in a bourgeois way, wears down his Dionysian, Dion, Dion, Dionysian or Dionysian, I think it's Dionysian, I don't know, Dionysian. I'm having a lot of difficulty with this word. Dionysian, <laughs> Dionysian horns on reality. As Freud calls his bourgeois environment, the commodity world and its ideology. The thus educated ego has become reasonable. It no longer allows itself to be controlled by the pleasure principle, but follows the reality principle, which basically also wants to achieve pleasure, but pleasure ensured by consideration of reality, even if this is postponed and diminished pleasure. And yet the ego, the reality itself, or the bourgeois outside world, would not yet be sufficient to censor and also to sublimate the libidinal drives if there was not also, next to and above them, the superego or the ego ideal. The superego is the other content of the ego. According to Freud, it represents our relations to our parents. It creates all the surrogate formations of piety. The ego represents the rights of the outside world. The superego is, however, the advocate of the inner world, the origin of conscience and of guilt feelings. Understood is the tensions between the claims of conscience and the achievements of the ego. It is the seed from which all religions have developed. By representing father and mother, the super the superego observes, threatens, and controls the ego as the parents had previously observed, threatened, threatened and controlled the child. Thus it gives the ego a guiding image and is the source of the formation of ideals. But precisely because of the, of the continuing effect of parental authority, a threatening element can easily exist in the superego. The conscience is strict, the sense of duty somber, and also the superego very often retains from its parental side the traditions and ideals of the past. Nevertheless, it skirts round the wakeful ego to get to the libido, to the common dark, to the id of the inner world united in the dark. All this is added to the original libido, at least in the later Freud. Thus, an extraordinary superstructure of drives exists. Admittedly, one which is supposed to be largely dismantled again through analysis, in which, as far as the contents of the superego are concerned, to which not only religion, but, for example, also the postulates of changing the world belong supposedly consists exclusively of illusions with regard to the, the outside world. The inner world itself, however, which finds its advocate in the superego and the final analysis always remains that of the libido or the repressed drives of the unconscious id in man. The id of this libido is and remains, according to Freud, the unconscious realm of drives that fills the body and surrounds us seen from its animal side as well as from that of the superego, with the result that we are lived by unknown, uncontrollable forces, in other words, by the alien domination of the capitalist mode of production, which Freud has made into the libido id. Psychoanalysis, on the other hand, is a tool which should make the progressive conquest of the id by the ego possible. This merely has the effect of freeing the basic libidinal drive again, that is, it is neither diminished in acts of repression nor eclipsed in ties of the ego ideal. Freud does indeed want to bring the repressed and unconscious material in it rationally to light. That is, to reduce the hip hypocritical and neurosis creating mustiness. But what should follow is solely daylight within the private libido and within the discontent of a civilization where apparently nothing more than a breath of psychoanalytic air is lacking. Repression, complex, unconscious material, and sublimation. Thus the sexual drive, if not the be-all and end-all, still remains fundamental here. The decent girl simply refuses to admit it, 
the demure ego represses sexuality, but consequently the latter now begins to ferment and to urge all the more. It cannot work itself off in the existing or permitted life. Sexuality and its wishes are wrapped up by bourgeois people, as Freud found them, in a thick web of secrecy, of hypocrisy and lies. For in fact, the libido in the individual himself, not just in the cant of society, is subject to a moralizing censorship, which does not allow our true being to step over the threshold of consciousness. This censorship debars, it represses the sexual impulse, it slanders it. As soon as the repression is not totally successful, it blocks itself off against knowledge of it. The libido here remains for Freud both the single, basic drive and the essential content of human existence. For the ego is, as noted, only a checking authority. It inspects the baggage brought in by the libido. It forces the libido... Um, It forces the, the libido to disguise itself, if necessary, to sublimate itself into intellectual material, but the ego itself is unproductive. Of course, when it represses, the moralizing censor censorship only removes the repressed material on the surface. The unfulfilled, even hushed up wishes simply sink down in the process of repression into the more or less unconscious. There they fester, form neurotic tensions and complexes without the sufferer becoming aware of the cause. The merely forgotten, not vanished sexual affective processing continues to work in all manner of disguises. Freud was already looking to demonstrate the prompting of the libido in the psychopathology of everyday life, in slips of the tongue, bungled actions, in slips of the seemingly most coincidental, most insignificant kind. Drives which have not been worked off, incomplete experiences, forgotten wounds and disappointments continue to smart. They have disappeared from the consciousness of the ego, but not from the psyche. From them derive seemingly unfounded oversensitivity, overreaction, compulsively neurotic activity, and finally the group of emotions which has become senselessly independent and devoid of content, the complex. All ghosts, or perhaps merely Freudian ghosts, appear here. Penis envy, the castration, and Oedipus complexes, and more besides. According to Freud, a sexual irritation is at the bottom of all complexes. They are fixated on an infantile, forgotten trauma. From the experiences of childhood derives the castration complex, the so-called Oedipus complex of father hatred. Although Oedipus himself, as Chesterton says, was the only man who certainly had no Oedipus complex, since he did not know until the end that Laertes, whom he killed, was his father, and Jocasta, whom he married, was his mother. Supposedly, all these strangely named phenomena, even more strange because they are thundered up from below, have entirely resulted from interrupted, somehow disturbed processes which had to remain unconscious. If it were then possible to go down with consciousness into the cellar of the repressed, to make the unconscious preconditions of the neurotic symptoms conscious, then the neurotic would be cured, that is, his ego would have his id under its thumb. The person who knows the cause of his complexes cures himself, though only psychoanalysis can help him to this knowledge. Laborious probing into the depths, paying attention to seemingly incidental authorities, particularly to authorities made to seem incidental, but also to mistrust of ideologies which sound much too nice, like sanctity of motherhood and the like. All this detective skill is necessary to recognize the content of the neurotic symptom and to call it into the patient's consciousness. The main road there, via, reg or via Regia, is supposed to be the interpretation of dreams as is well known. In fact, the interpretation of nocturnal dreams as such being those where the censoring ego is asleep and the harsh external world can no longer be perceived. For Freud, every dream is the fulfillment of an unconscious wish fantasy. The task is to decipher analytically the wishfully announced material from the symbolism in which it cloaks itself in the dream. 
At all stages, the neurotic puts up a characteristic resistance to this deciphering. The forgotten wants to remain forgotten and its symptoms to remain disguised. But it is nevertheless important to note here. The resistance to them becoming conscious lies, according to Freud, solely in the will of the patient, not, for example, in the material of the unconscious itself, i.e. that unconscious which Freud himself establishes and which, apart from the grotesque quality of its essentially merely libidinal contents, is essentially a product, or at least a refuge, of, of repression. Repression itself is in this sense a process through which an act capable of consciousness i.e. one which belongs to the system of pre-consciousness, is made unconscious, i.e. pushed back into the system of unconsciousness. And likewise, we call it repression, when the unconscious mental act is not permitted to enter the next pre-conscious system at all, but is turned away on the threshold by censorship. The libido which has been made conscious thus reveals no other door than that through which we re-enter the reeled up long ago, long ago. Psychoanalysis seeks to be um, ab ovo, subcortical memory, solitary, encapsulated, and as it, as, it, as it itself states, subterranean, acherontic. The unconscious in Freud is, per, is therefore one into which something can only be pushed back, or which at best as id surrounds consciousness as if this were a closed ring a phylogenetic inheritance all around conscious man. With the help of the superego, the ego draws in a way that is still obscure to us on the experiences of prehistory stored up in the id. The unconscious of psychoanalysis is therefore, as we can see, never a not yet conscious, an element of progressions. It consists rather of regressions. Accordingly, even the process of making this unconscious conscious only clarifies what has been i.e. there is nothing new in the Freudian unconscious. This became even clearer when C.G. Young, the psychoanalytic fascist, reduced the, the libido and its unconscious contents entirely to the primeval. According to him, exclusively phylogenetic primeval memories or primeval fantasies exist in the unconscious, falsely designated archetypes, and all wishful images also go back into this night, only suggest it only suggests prehistory. Young even considers the night to be so colorful that consciousness pales beside it. As a spurner of the light, he devalues consciousness. In contrast, Freud does of course uphold illuminating consciousness, but one which is itself surrounded by the ring of the id, by the fixed unconscious of a fixed libido. Even highly productive artistic creations do not lead out lead out of this fixum. They are simply sublimations of the self-enclosed libido. Imagination is a substitute for the fulfillment of drives. The problem to be solved then, says Freud, is to displace the drive goals in such a way that they cannot be affected by the failure of the external world. The sex drive can be refined into caritas, caritas into devotion to the well-being of one's neighbor, ultimately of humanity. More highly sublimated libido constitutes the pleasure the artist derives from his creation, but also the enjoyment and the vicarious satisfaction the non-artist derives from a work of art. The latter does, after all, provide pure wish fulfillment of a shaped yet uninhibited kind. Women, women, wedding heroes, and even the beautiful, tragic corpse it provides the man in the stalls with what he lacks in life, it provides cloth of gold like a beautiful dream in the night does. The viewer or the spectator works off his wishes in this way so, they, so that they no longer cause him pain. But every catharsis of this kind remains temporary, in fact, illusory. Art, according to Freud, works exclusively with the illusions with which the unsatisfied libido allows itself to be fooled. How mechanistically far away Freud is here from Pavlov's realization that precisely the higher psychological processes work with the constant influence of the changes in the environment which they have grasped on the emotional and organic processes, that they are in no way merely dependent nor inherently hollow modes of substitution. 
In Freud, however, there remain only sexual libido, its conflict with the ego drives in the cellar of consciousness as a whole, from which the illusions then rise. Power drive, frenzy drive, collective unconscious. No matter how dully grasped the body is, the sexual drive does not live in it all the time, nor alone. After he had taken this road, Freud, as we know, was therefore contradicted by several of his pupils. These pupils were quick either to distinguish a quite different driving force or to bronze the libido. Alfred Adler, the originator of so-called individual psychology, attempted to do the first, C.G. Young the second, with a, myth- with a mythical patina. Thus the problem of sexuality which weighs upon us all was eliminated at a stroke, for which Freud criticizes them both. At any rate, it seemed it could be eliminated. In systems based on different motivating forces, it is not the complete be-all and end-all. On a bisexual foundation, Adler posits, in supreme capitalist fashion, the will to power as the basic human drive. Primarily, man wants to rule and overpower. He wants to get from the bottom to the top, wants to lie on top, to pass from the female line in him to the male, feel himself individually confirmed as the victor. Vanity, ambition, male protest are accordingly the emotions in which this basic drive appears most visibly. Wounded vanity, failed ambition are the source of most neuroses. Sexuality is itself only a means to the final goal, the attainment of power. Libido, sex drive, and tendency to perversion, wherever they may have derived from, also line up behind this guiding principle. The feeling of insecurity and inferiority stands threateningly at the beginning of the development of neurosis. Unfulfilled power drive produces the inferiority complex, but as skin hardens over a wound as a protective measure, as it were against future damage, (coughs) and as the failure of one kidney strengthens the functioning of the other, mental inferiorities are likewise overcompensated by the ego. Partly through masks and fictions, Will to power then becomes will to appearance. Partly also, however, through higher achievements, will to power then recoups its losses, possibly in in a beautiful fantasy world. Though we do not see where it takes its material from here, for the will to power in itself necessarily bare cannot, of course, be sublimated as regards content. Nevertheless, goal setting remains essential in this will precisely in accordance with the desire to be out in front. It takes the place of mere innate drivenness from below, i.e. from the Freudian sexual libido. The individual person builds himself up by means of a guiding image, or even just just by means of play-acting and fiction. The insecurity which is felt to be embarrassing is reduced to its smallest proportions and then reversed into its extreme opposite into its contradiction, which has a fictional goal, is made into the guiding point of all wishes, fantasies, and endeavors. In this way, the person forms nothing other than the individual person appears in this individual psychology, his character. So as not to miss the path to the summit, to make it perfectly safe, he draws constantly effective guidelines in the form of character traits in the broad chaotic fields of his soul. Fundamentally, everything personal is thus made and cultivated from the outset in Adler through a largely unconscious but no longer in any way naive, purposive will. Thus, fundamentally, the causa finalis rules. The biological factor is subjugated to the capitalistically interested goal, which is geared to the safeguarding of the personality, to raising the feeling of personality. Because Adler, therefore, drives sex out of the libido and inserts individual power, his definition of drives takes the ever steeper capitalist path from Schopenhauer to Nietzsche and reflects this path. I lost my spot somehow. And reflects this path ideologically and psychoanalytically. Freud's concept of libido bordered on the will to life in Schopenhauer's philosophy. Schopenhauer, in fact, described 
uh, the sexual organs as the focal points of the will. Adler's will to power conversely coincides verbally and partly also in terms of content with Nietzsche's, defini <clears throat> with the Nietzsche's definition of the basic drive from his last period. In this respect, Nietzsche has triumphed over Schopenhauer here. That is to say, the imperialist elbow has triumphed over the gentlemanly pleasure-displeasure body in psychoanalysis. The competitive struggle, which hardly leaves any time for sexual worries, stresses industriousness rather than randiness. The hectic day of the businessman thus eclipses the hectic night of the rake and his libido. But even that did not last, for fewer and fewer people were attracted by the day which had become inhospitable. The petit bourgeoise's wish grew. I lost my fucking spot again. How does this keep happening? Uh, wish grew ever stronger to allow himself to lapse back into irresponsible, but also more or less wild obscurity. Above all, the path to the so-called heights lost some of its interests and prospects in exact proportion to the decline of free enterprise as a result of monopoly capitalism. The path became more attractive, which led into the so-called depths in which the eyes roll instead of aiming at a goal. C.G. Young, the fascistically frothing psychoanalyst, consequently posited the frenzied drive in place of the power drive. Just as sexuality is only part of this Dion Dionysian general libido, so also is the will to power. In fact, the latter is completely transformed into battle frenzy, into a stupor which in no way strives towards individual goals. In young, libido thus becomes an archaically undivided primeval unity of all drives, or eros per se. Consequently, it extends from eating to the last supper, from coitus to unio mystica, from the frothing mouth of the shaman, even the berserker, to the rapture of Fra Angelico. Even here, therefore, Nietzsche triumphs over Schopenhauer, but he triumphs as the affirmation of a masculine Dionysus over the negation of the will to life. As a result, the unconscious aspect of this mystified libido is also not contested, and there is no attempt to resolve it into current consciousness, as in Freud. Rather than neurosis, particularly that of modern, all too civilized and conscious man, derives, according to Jung, precisely from the fact that men have emerged too far out of what is unconsciously growing, outside the world of elemental feel thinking. Here, Jung borders not only on the fascist version of Dionysus, but also partly on the vitalistic philosophy of Bergson. Bergson had already, though still in a close, closed order in rigid geometry. Though still, sorry, Bergson had already, though still in a successionist liberal way, played off intuition against reason, creative unrest against closed order in rigid geometry. But far more so than with Bergson's Elan Vital, the fascist young borders on the romantic reactionary distortions which Bergson's vitalism underwent, as in sentimental penis poets like D.H. Lawrence, in complete Tarzan philosophers like Ludwig Kleggs. Bergson's Elan Vital still was still directed forwards. It corresponded to the art nouveau of secessionism of the 90s. It contained watchwords of freedom, none of regressive enslavement. D.H. Lawrence, on the other hand, and Young along with him, sings the wilderness of the elemental age of love, which to his misfortune man has emerged from. He seeks the nocturnal moon in the flesh, the unconscious sun in the blood. <clears throat> and Cleggs blows in a more abstract way on the same bullhorn, he does not only hark back like the earlier romantics to the Middle Ages, but to the diluvium, to precisely where Young's impersonal, pandemonic libido lives. There are... Sorry. There are, of course, egos and in individuals.
Young teaches, but they do not go deep in the soul. The personality itself is only a mask or a socially played role. What works in the personality and as such is instead supposed to be vital pressure from much deeper, much older layers, from the magical collective layers of the race, for example. The individual person is collective on this ground and leads back to it again. Since the individual is not only a single being, but also assumes collective relationships to his existence, the process of individuation therefore also leads not into isolation, but into a more intensive and more general collective context. Uh, that was a quote from Young. Contests and free competition, which in Adler still spurred people on to outstrip each other and to keener and keener individual psychology, are submerged here into the folk community and into psychosynthesis. This means, in fact, into archaic collective regression. Impersonally, in fact, inhumanly, unconscious material opens up, a long way behind every individual experience, if not behind the archaic traces of the mere memory of humanity. Accordingly, primal memories are supposed to be active from the time of our animal forefathers, i.e. a long way behind the delivium, or del deluvium, Young appropriates the concept of the engram for this, which Seaman introduced into biology, the concept of a memory of the whole of organic matter and its memory traces. They are incorporated in libido as a primal animal plan, but they also keep the unconscious per se in the archaic primal dimension of what has been. Thus, psychosynthesis does not disperse into day and into external pieces, but reflects and takes the neurotically or otherwise given symbol back into its ancestral night. Just as analysis, the causal reductive process, divides the symbol into its components, the synthetic process condenses the symbol into a general incomprehensible expression. Freud's unconscious, despite phylogenetic archaic elements which he no doubt believed he saw and which in his school have been excavated down to the primal memories of the first land animals, Freud's unconscious was therefore largely individual, that is, filled with individually acquired repressions and with repressions from the recent past of a modern individual. Young's unconscious, on the other hand, is entirely general, primeval, and collective. It purports to be the 500,000-year-old shaft beneath the few thousand years of civilization, particularly beneath the few years of individual life. In this basic ground, there is not only nothing new, but what it contains is decidedly primeval. Everything new is ipso facto without value, in fact hostile to value, according to Young and Clegg's. The only thing that is new today is the destruction of instinct, the undermining of the ancient basic ground of the imagination by the intellect. Even neurotic conflict is the suffering caused by intellect to this basic ground of the drives and of the imagination. Or, as Lawrence said, men have lost the moon in their flesh, the sun in their blood. Thus, the neurotic must not be completely removed from the unconscious material which he still has. Rather, what it necess what is necessary is guidance back to the collective unconscious to the age-old forces of life. Psychosynthesis, fleeing the present, hating the future, searching for primeval time, thus becomes the same as religion in the etymological sense of the word, namely religio, connecting back. And in fact, there appears to be no difference between the frothing mouth of the shaman and Meister Eckhart in true night tolerance. Indeed, the shaman is better. Then the most rampant superstition ranks more than ever above enlightenment, since, of course, Young's collective unconscious flows thicker in witch crazes than in pure reason. Eros in the Archetypes It comes to this, among other things, when the conscious ego is taken away from the body, when the libido is driven completely into the dark, into the unconscious as a goal. In... In Freud, the sick person was only reminded of the unconscious so that he could free himself from it. In C.G. Young, however, he is reminded of it so that he plunges headlong into the unconscious, into layers lying deeper and deeper, lying deeper and deeper in the past. 
libido becomes archaic blood and soil neanderthal man and tertiary period leap out simultaneously to confront us gottfried ben the disciple of young and Clegg's, gave this an equally psychosynthetic and lyrical expression we carry the early peoples in our souls and when the late ratio loses its hold in dream and intoxication they rise up with their rights their pre-logical way of thinking and dispense an hour of mystical participation when the logical superstructure dissolves and the cortex tired of the onslaught of the pre-lunar stock opens the eternally contested border of consciousness it is then that the old the unconscious appears in the magic ego transformation and identification and the earlier experience of being everywhere and eternal young drove the libido harder and harder towards these archaic connections at the same time he grasped these beginnings so nebulously and generally that the whole ratio of those times quite regardless of what it says can be accommodated interchangeably this really is the night in which all cows are gray the night of that immeasurably extended libido collectivized in the idea of the bosom of nature which is now also called world soul eros plato indian the theosoph theosophy alchemical and astro astrological imagery plotinus or what cg young imagines by this swirl around each other all united in the pre-lunar libido as far as the psychological aspect of this concept is concerned, I remind the reader here of the cosmogen cosmogenic significance of Eros in Plato, Plato and in Hesiod, as well as the Orphic figure of Phineas, the Revealer, the first to come into being, being the father of Eros. The Orphic significance of Phineas matches that of the Indian karma, the love god, who is also a cosmogenic uh, principle. Young adds across huge gulfs as if, because it sounds so cosmic, it were the same thing. And the Neoplatonist Plotinus, the world's soul is the energy of the intellect. In this way, the libido in Young opens up like a sack of undigested atavistic secrets, or rather, abracadabras. In fact, this sack, in Young's own words, drags an invisible dinosaur tail behind it. Carefully separated, it becomes the savior serpent of the mystery. For accordingly, Diluvium remains the closest thing to Eros, who began everything, and Eros strives to get back to it, along pre-logical lines away from consciousness. The anatomical location of this libido is the ancient sympathetic nerve, not the cerebrospinal system. Its organon, already itself semi-insufficient, all too enlightened, remains mythology. The mother bond, for example, is according to Young, not to the individual mother, but to an ancient general mother image. It is the bond with Gaia or Sibeli, um, with that archaic beingness, binness, which is also supposed to be behind Astarte, Isis, and Mary. The occupation of libido thus subsequently becomes prototyp prototypal per se, per se here. The archetypes of the earth mother shine and triumph through every individual mother. Archetype in general, Levi Brule's representation collective, is the cue with which Young's libido brings on its collective unconscious. Thereafter, the unconscious, and only this, is universally populated by archetypes. Snake kitchen, fire, pot on the fire, deep waters, mother earth, the old wise man are a few examples of it. This prototypical material is supposed to be highly inflam inflammable, especially for a man of today, that is, one who is a mixture of myths. He who speaks in archetypes speaks with a thousand tongues. And this, according to Jung, simply because the creature of intellect is mediated with the drive image life of the primeval man animal with the enormous resonance of blood and soil. Collective unconscious is, however, not only the location of this kind of health, according to Jung, it also contains all the basic forms of human imagination, all better or more beautiful worlds that have ever been dreamt of our racial souls, archetypal time. Thus the mandate to strive from the light into the darkness was followed here in such stupefying fashion. 
It is only possible to run capitalist business if the consciousness of its victims is stupefied in their free time. Consequently, Jung generalized and archaized Freud's unconscious right down the line. It is not supposed to be resolved rationally. No sublimation takes place here either, which, according to Freud, does at least lead to culture. Freud's pupil, Jung, dissociated himself also on this point from Jewish psychology when the stars were propitious. The sacred, dark, primeval night, complete with bloody visions and a veritable orgy of images, replaces sublimation. This force is already in good order. It is, in fact, the only thing that lives in good order. Young did stumble upon a not unimportant, as we shall see, imaginative stock here upon that of archetypes. But just as he took his concept of them from uh, romanticism, he also failed to extricate it from unstructured romantic dilettantism. Prototyping is only suitable for so-called psychosynthesis lock, stock, and barrel and magical wishy-washiness commanded by monopoly capitalism is useful for its purposes. The rapport of this panic libido with German fascism is obvious. The consciousness of the C.G. Young somn somnambulist is in no way suspended here. To fascism also, hatred of intelligence is, as Young actually says, the only means of compensating for the damages of today's society. Fascism, too, needs the death cult of a dolled-up primeval age to obstruct the future, to establish barbarism, and to block revolution. Given all this, the basic drive becomes a drive towards that basic ground where, where Dionysus only wants to be called Moloch. A basic ground of regressio is praised as medicine and morality, a ground from which everything human has again become estranged. Thus, Freud, as we said, who did at least want to bring liberal enlightenment and the fascistic mystifier Jung, present extensive contradictions in their common depth psychology, as it modestly calls itself. The liberal wants to make repressed material conscious. The reactionary wants to connect conscious material back with the repressed, to push it back ever deeper into the unconscious. In Freud, the unconscious is combated and, as far as it is individually acquired, kept in the orbit of the individual. In Jung, the unconscious is welcomed and completely settled in their archaic collective and is also contemplated with limitless tolerance towards everything that swirls around in it as a fog, numen or taboo. But neither must we forget, Freud the teacher is on the same plane as his perverted pupil on the crucial point both understand the unconscious solely as something past in historical development, as something that has sunk down into the cellar and only exists there. They both, <clears throat> they both recognize, even if the regression has an extremely different nature and extension, only an unconscious that moves backwards or underneath the already existing consciousness. They in fact recognize no pre-consciousness of a new. And so far as the drive theory under discussion here is concerned, the whole psychoanalytical school is connected in that it emphasizes solely spicy drives and moreover lifts them in a conceptually mythical way out of the living body. In this way, an idolized libido arises or will to power um, or will to power or primeval Dionysus. And more significantly, these idols are made absolute. Just as that which has been made absolute is lifted out of the living body, which, after all, only wants to preserve itself, and that is all, so too in Freud and Adler, and especially in Jung, it is never discussed as a variable of socioeconomic conditions. But if basic drives are to be distingu distinguished at all, they will vary widely in material terms in men according to individual classes and epochs, and consequently in terms of intention or as drive direction, and most importantly, the respective psychoanalytical basic drives that are emphasized are not basic drives at all in the strict sense. They are too partial. They do not break through so unequivocally as, say, hunger, the drive that is always left out of psychoanalytical theory. 
They are not such final authorities as the simple drive to keep oneself alive. This drive is the self-preservation drive. It alone might be so fundamental, no matter what changes occur, as to set all the other drives in motion in the first place.